one. Hi, everybody. It's great to be back uh, the, for the Endowers webinar, Ask Your CIO session. Um, today, we have a special guest, uh, Sean Wong, who's our head of investments. Sean, say hi. Hi, everyone. All right, fantastic. And we've got a, another amazing session for you because uh, Endowers has, again, um, really led the industry in innovation. Uh, working with our fund management partners to introduce some of the best in class solutions and products and funds available here in Singapore. Uh, we're really excited to introduce Singapore's lowest cost passive index funds. It's actually the low, one of them is the lowest cost unit trust in the history of Singapore, I think, um, and much cheaper than uh, even SGX listed ETF. So that's really exciting. So uh, without further ado, uh, I want to welcome everybody to the webinar and jump right in. Um, we have to start with our disclaimers um, that we quickly run through. And then um, also, again, the Slidos. Uh, on YouTube, you have the Slido poll numbers below. So if you miss it uh, now, uh, it's going to be shown uh, on the slides on the top, this side corner, this side, OK? Um, and then also on the YouTube channel. Uh, in Davos, very briefly, for those who are joining us for the very first time, very welcome to you. And um, I want to just you know introduce the company to you. Um, Endowers has a mission to help everyone invest better so that we can live easier today and better tomorrow. Uh, it is a fee-only wealth platform, digital first, but it's really famous for being the first digital advisor uh, for all of your money, starting with CPF, uh, but also your cash savings and now also your SRS. So the only digital wealth platform that uh, you can invest all your source of funds it is the only platform that allows you to manage your private wealth and your public pension. Um, we are backed by some of the leading uh, VC investors, but also strategic investors, just highlighting two, uh, UBS, which is the biggest private bank in the world. Uh, their first investment in Asia Pacific as a fintech company was in Dawas. Uh, also uh, EDBI, the Economic Development Board's global investment arm, um, uh, the government of Singapore, uh, is a shareholder investor uh, of Indawas as well. Um, the people that are building the platform and the solutions, uh, Sean and I obviously lead the investment uh, part of the business, uh, but obviously we have a, a huge technology team and engineering and product team uh, led by Ju and JX and other members, Deepak. Uh, all of us are really um, very focused on delivering the mission of providing uh, the best uh, experience, but also the lowest cost, um, really building the future uh, of wealth um, through a fee-only advisory-led uh, service. So we are deep thin as well as deep tech. Why our clients choose us? Um, really, the three major pillars of success in building wealth are advice, access, and cost. And so we have really focused as an independent wealth advisor uh, to give you the most um, professional, independent uh, advice so that you can have the highest probability or the highest chance of success in building wealth over the long term across all of your funds. Uh, but also we really focus on access. And today's webinar is really about this middle piece of really solving the problem that individual investors had here in Singapore uh, of you know, accessing great products and funds and solutions that were previously not available. So um, giving access to institutional share class funds, you know, um, alternatives and private investments that were previously not available. And today we are introducing the lowest cost passive index funds um, available here in Singapore as well. Uh, we work with the leading fund managers. So more than 70 fund managers who combined manage tens of trillions of assets, pretty much who's who uh, of the asset management industry here in Singapore. Um, and we are actually bringing more of them into Singapore, into the retail space. Uh, Wellington, which was an accredited investor or professional investor only uh, wealth, man uh, sorry, fund manager, um, actually is launching their retail services here in Singapore. And so we work well together with them to build um, new products and solutions. We've launched several new funds that were previously not available, institutional share class, uh, lowest cost with great partners like Dimensional, like BlackRock, 
um, like PIMCO, for example, and today uh, with the Mundi as well. Uh, just to, I want to touch on the macro and markets briefly, as you know, it is the the, the top topic du jour. Um, you know, everybody is talking about it. And as an investment ad advisory firm, while we today we're focusing on the product launch, uh, did want to spend a little bit of time um, to uh, talk about the macro and markets a little bit. Uh, obviously, uh, the Fed moved um, overnight. Um, and uh, Powell, um, the Fed chair, announced a 75 basis points increase, the, the highest increase in since 1994, um, and opened the door for a further increase of 75 basis points or possibly 50 by uh, next month as well. Remember that we have another Fed meeting next month before we take a break. Um, and so um, I think the Fed will likely continue to be hawkish, uh, raise interest rates, um, and try to tame inflation, which obviously has, you know, been much higher than people expected. Another 40-year high was hit uh, during May. Uh, the Fed actually tracks not the CPI, but the PCE, um, a Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, um, with the May data will actually come out on the 30th of June. So we should look out for that. Um, and I think that with the Fed announcement, the, the risk of recession uh, has increased quite significantly. Obviously, we've always said this, but the market is a leading indicator. So by the time the recession maybe is confirmed uh, through economic data, uh, because economic data is always lagging by a month or two, um, and then uh, readjusted after that, um, we would probably have the market price in a recession uh, before we even officially announce it. Um, the market's already down 20%. Uh, NASDAQ and growth stocks are down even more by 30% plus. Uh, remembering that COVID, during the COVID crisis, we had a, a, a peak to trough fall of over 33% uh, for the global indices. Uh, we're still not uh, at that level. Um, and we're definitely not as far uh, ahead as, you know, the global financial crisis, which was uh, a much more system, systematic uh, crisis, whereas this is a much more cyclical one. But there is a lot of market uncertainty and volatility. And the data point to really focus on is inflation. If, is, if inflation starts coming down and PC data starts easing from next month, uh, then we may see the Fed easing off the pedal uh, quite quickly. Instead of a 75 basis point hike, we may even get a 50 basis point. And then beyond that, um, in September, we may get uh, a 25 basis points instead of 50. So uh, we will have to track the infl inflation data very quickly, uh, very closely. Um, because that's going to be driving policy. It's going to be driving market interest rates and market sentiment. Um, there is a case to be made that the supply side um, of inflation is not going to correct itself anytime soon. Uh, an additional worry that has crept up recently is the West Coast uh, Dockers Union uh, renegotiation that's been happening. Um, if they go on strike, that's another blow uh, to the supply side constraints that have you know, hampered global supply chains uh, and pricing generally across the globe. Uh, so those are things that I think we should continue to watch out for. Uh, if we see the next slide, um, I think that in this environment, um, you know, active investors um, who manage active mutual funds have actually suffered more. Um, so the markets are down 20% plus for S&P 500, uh, for global indices down similarly, uh, close to 20%. Uh, growth and tech stocks are down 30% plus. China tech is down more. Uh, but if you look at this very simple graphic that displays the combined median, uh, sorry, mean return of the 244 active global funds out there versus an indexed, uh, passive index solution like the iShares Global 100, um, out of the 244 funds, if you look at the track record over the past five year period, not just one, two years, but five years uh, on a rolling basis, uh, we see that only two funds have actually outperformed. So two funds out of 244, less than 1% have actually outperformed the benchmark. Um, if you compare to the, meet, uh, the benchmark index return or passive index fund, because there is a cost uh, to being passive and index. Um, and if you use that, um, then the difference in returns from 100,000 invested just five years ago, a passive index fund would still have given you $194,000 at the end of April. We have to update this for me. So apologies um, for, for being 
uh, one month old. Uh, but you know, 194,000 uh, at the end of April. But if you had invested in an active fund, that you know would have only given you a return of 154,000, and that number would be much less um, by the middle of June now. Um, since then, markets have come down. So the gap between just being purely passive versus trying to beat the benchmark actively, like a lot of uh, active mutual fund investors do, but a lot of active ETFs do also these days, uh, and active robo-advisors too, they all uh, actively try to beat the market and fail miserably in doing so. Um, and so passive investment is something that is always going to be in your favor because the probability of success of you at least doing the market or doing better than the market is actually higher. Whereas when you invest in active funds, especially in a downturn, it's going to really eat into your returns uh, and be painful, um, like this statistic has proven over the past five years. Next page. Um, and I think, you know, in this time of, um, you know, weak returns, uh, in a time of market volatility or market correction, what really hurts us even more is cost. So, um, you know, the average cost of that active fund is significantly higher uh, than the cost of a passive index fund by, by definition. Um, and it, you know, if you look at the analysis done uh, between, uh, for example, on the left chart, you can see an 8.5% return, uh, let's say an index, where uh, the index fund is a 50 basis point fee, 0.5%. Uh, uh, over 30 years, it would have compounded, a million dollars would have compounded into a $10 million uh, return um, over 30 years if you had received 8.5% minus the 0.5%, so 8% net return. But if you had invested in an active fund, even if they had just met the benchmark return uh, with a higher fee of 1.5%, that 1% percentage point difference uh, between 8% and 7%, would have resulted in a $2.5 million difference over 30 years. And this is from an investment of just 1 million. So a 245% difference in returns uh, between an 8% and a 7% return, just because you invested in a high cost mutual fund um, or a high fund active fund, uh, high cost active fund. On the right side, this is another way to cut it. And we put in a diff lower number to make it more reasonable, let's say, these days. 6% return, uh, 100,000 initial investment over, let's say, 25 years, a shorter period, um, would have resulted in you gaining about 400, three, another 330,000 to take you to $430,000. But if you had had a, a fee of 2%, um, that's higher, which is very common in the mutual fund space, um, that would have resulted in the, the loss of returns of 170,000. So more than half of the returns you would have gained would have been lost. Uh, mathematically, it seems like it doesn't make sense, but it's that curve on the left. It's the compounding effect of returns, but also the cost also compounds over time. And therefore, you're actually losing a lot of returns, especially towards the tail end of, of your investment horizon um, when you're older and when you probably need that money the most. Um, with that, I'm gonna like introduce, really excited. So we've been working with uh, the largest European fund manager called Amundi. Um, they have multiple uh, fund management arms. Um, they're very good active and passive investors. So they straddle both. Um, and they've recently bought another uh, large index player called like Likesaw. Like um, as well to become the dominant um, passive index uh, fund and passive index ETF provider uh, in Europe. So combined with BlackRock and Vanguard, they are one of the biggest players in the space. So they are a local Singapore registered fund management company. Uh, they're also admitted into the CPF investment scheme and therefore are a, a CPF included fund manager. Um, so we've been working with them for uh, almost nine months now to make this happen, um, to launch four amazing low-cost passive index funds um, of, of four of the most important segments of it. So the first one is the MSCI World. And a lot of people get this confused. The MSCI World is a developed market index. So the MSCI All Country World Index is actually the ACQUI. Uh, that is the global index. And the global index comprises of the world index, developed markets, 
and the third one here, which is the emerging market. So if you combine that, that becomes the whole country world index, and that's the global index. Now we've broken it down because different investors have different needs. Some people want exposure and building blocks. And so if you combine those two, then obviously you get the old country world index. And so this is a common way institutional investors do it so that you can actually have different building blocks and have different allocations. So we have the four most important components, the developed market index, the MSCI emerging market index, and the one in the middle is a, is a USA prime fund. The USA prime fund is a low cost index uh, fund um, for the United States market is very, very similar to the S&P 500 uh, that Sean will explain uh, later in much more detail um, with about 500, just under 550 names there versus the 500 plus um, in the S&P 500. Uh, they have 504 stocks actually um, because of their multiple listings. Um, but basically it's very similar to the S&P 500 exposure to US large and mid cap. And the cost, look at that, five basis points, 0.05%. That fee of 0.05% is the lowest fee of any fund here in Singapore. It is lower than every single SGX listed ETF. Um, so amazing low cost funds um, that track the passive indexes uh, that are most representative. And those three are the equities portion. Um, and the fourth one is the global aggregate 500 million fund, uh, which is basically the largest part um, of the global aggregate index, which is the representative uh, fixed income um, fund, uh, fi fixed income index. And so these are all efficient, low cost, passive market access. These are low cost, sing dollar denominated currency. And for the fixed income, sing dollar hedged. And if you look at that expense ratio, not just the management fee, but the expense ratio, it is the lowest cost effective um, index exposure that you can gain. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Sean. Thank you, Sam. And uh, just, just kind of reemphasize a couple points uh, on here. So one is, um, as Sam alluded to, we have efficient market access. So these index funds provide access to thousands of securities and many single country markets that are otherwise not easily available. And they often form the backbone of many portfolios. Often investors use these index funds in combination with a satellite portfolio to express their views on certain segments of the market. And when these scale as a large experienced and highly regarded manager with substantial assets under management allow them to accurately re replicate the indices that they're tracking with low tracking error and importantly to keep costs down as Sam alluded to as well. On the cost effective point, you'll see there on the total returns extremely low, they use sophisticated methods to improve efficiency, such as negotiating low transaction costs through scale, having a robust replication methodology. You'll see the different methodologies on the right. Index fund structures that Amundi uses do not have wide bid-ask spreads on a portfolio level. Bid-ask spreads, again, are the gap between buying and selling of a security. This is especially apparent on instruments traded on the Singapore exchange, where the bid-ask spreads often exceed even the cost of the management fees. I'll get into examples of this later. In the case of funds with low liquidity, this is especially apparent. And thus investors need to consider this when they invest in the total, in evaluating the total cost of these funds. In fact, the Amundi Prime USA fund is the cheaper than any other SGX listed ETF and any other US market unit trusts in Singapore. Finally, these funds are SGG denominated. So Singapore and based investors do not have to deal with currency fluctuations as they're subject to when trading US dollar denominated in Singapore. Over here, we wanted to share a little bit more about the difference between unit trusts and ETFs. They're both similar in the way that they're both funds and they can invest into markets in an active or passive way. While that's the only similarity, there's a lot of important differences. The key difference between unit trusts and ETFs is that they're listed differently. Exchange traded funds, as the name suggests, are open ended mutual funds and listed on a stock exchange. Unit trusts are closed and they're not listed on an exchange. And the number of ETFs and unit trusts have actually exceeded the number of stocks in the world, interestingly. So managers are again putting these in different ways and forming many different vehicles as well. While the listing status might not seem like a big deal, it actually has a significant impact on liquidity and pricing and may bring about significant differences in between unit trusts and ETFs. So ETFs listed on a stock exchange trade like a stock, 
meaning that investors that trade these instruments are subject to a bid and ask spread. If an ETF has low liquidity, for example, low tra daily trading volumes, small market caps, or are largely held by insiders, the bid ask spread can actually be <clears throat> quite large. Example here is some of the ETFs listed on the Singapore exchange. Expenses that investors pay to invest in these ETFs are pretty low from five to 20 basis points. However, they have bid ask spreads that exceed even one or one and a half percent. So the total cost for trading these is actually in excess of one to one and a half percent. So in such cases, investing in these ETFs can be extremely costly. In contrast, unit trusts don't face the same issue as they're not priced based on bid ask spreads. They trade once a day at specific net asset values or NAVs as we think about them and not at an intraday price. The NAV takes into, into the account all the trading costs associated with the index fund on that specific day. This makes unit trust investing less complicated as an investor does not need to consider the bid ask spread when investing. Putting some real life numbers around what I just said, this is what a Singapore investor looks at when they're buying an Amundi passive index trust or comparable ETF in the market. So in this case, we're looking at an investor either buying global developed market equities at the top or US market equities. Amundi funds, as we noted earlier, do not have a bid ask spread. So you'll see that 0% there, which keep the total cost down. So I wanna drill down into this a little bit more. So we just put in here the EM equities and the global fixed income fund as well. If I take a closer look at the Amundi Prime USA fund, um, compared with other vehicles that an investor can consider when trying to track the US equity index, there are a few points to make here. Singapore investors do not face the currency conversion. So you'll see that it's in Sing dollar denominated. We do not have the bid ask spread. So total costs have kept extremely low at a total of five basis points, 0.05%. You can see comparable ETFs listed within the Singapore Stock Exchange and their comparable fees as well, which are significantly higher. The next thing we look at if we're doing an analysis on this fund is does it track the index fairly closely? So what you'll see here is that the Amundi Prime USA fund tracks the sole active United States large and mid cap index, which has an extremely low tracking error to the MSCI USA or S&P 500 index. This is very popular with most investors trying to get access to the US market. So you can see the correlation is close to one over time. Sorry, Sean, can I just add one thing on the previous slide? Because there's a question and a lot of people are obviously going to be asking a lot about the Infinity uh, US 500 stock index fund, which is um, a Vanguard S&P 500 fund uh, that is really low cost. That is that is wrapped by Lion Global here in Singapore. And so we brought that um down even lower because we have 100 percent trailer fee rebates and line global strategically decided to give us a higher rebate so even though the ter the total expense ratio is 63 basis points 0 0.63 um and it was still cheaper than the sgx listed uh s p 500 spider because of the bid ask spread uh, of one percent um with the trailer fee rebates you get that on the endows platform at 0 0.35 percent which at the time was almost revolutionary, especially because we took that into CPF. Um, but on the other platforms, it would have cost you 0.63%, which is almost twice as much. Um, with this launch, we're effectively undercutting that by a significant margin. So almost 30, basis, it is exactly 30 basis points, 0.3% cheaper. So one seventh the cost basically um, versus the Infinity S&P 500. Uh, versus the Infinity Global, which is the MSCI World Index, that one is slightly more expensive at 0.47%. Um, so is the Amundi MSCI World uh, at 0.18. But the difference again is 29 basis points or almost 30 uh, basis points, which is which means that with the Amundi funds, you're effectively saving 0.3% for effectively the same exposure every single year. So you're going to improve returns by 0.3% by doing nothing but using in DAOs. And that the most exciting thing is that because no one else is willing to distribute low cost funds with no trailer fees, it's exclusively available on the DAOs platform. So that's something that is really exciting. Uh, but we, I mean, the Infinity 500 and the Infinity Global Stock Index, I mean, Line Global is a very important uh, partner of ours. Uh, they've worked really hard for us. Uh, the Infinity European Stock Index is still available. Uh, we have several Infinity, uh, sorry, Lion Global, Enhanced Liquidity Fund is an amazing 
uh, short-term uh, liquidity product, uh, and we have it available in USD. So we, we work very strategic with Lion Global. Uh, but in this case, um, the Amundi funds are significantly cheaper and much more accessible uh, at virtually the same um, index exposure. Just want to answer that question uh, before we move on. Back to you, Sean. Thank you, Sam. So what we wanted to do in the next section was provide a walkthrough of how you can create a 100% pure passive portfolio with these four Amundi funds that we just launched exclusively. On your investor landing page, as you always do, you can click Add Goal. Then you set up your portfolio. So for goal type, we're looking at a mid to long-term investing with a funding source that the most investors can choose between funding with cash or SRS, soon to be able to select ETF as well. You toggle your loss tolerance. In this case, these are equity and fixed income funds. So the loss tolerance is slightly higher. Then you move to the fund selection page. So in this case, obviously we're searching for the Amundi Passive Index Trust. So we'll search for Amundi. We select between the four Amundi funds that you'd like to purchase. In this case, I've selected all funds for this, um, this demo. So with selection of these four funds, so I'm adding each fund. And what I'll do here is I will select an allocation. So in this case, I have the MSCI, Amundi Index MSCI Emerging Markets Fund. So this is an emerging markets equity, broad equity exposure. I've decided to put 10% here as I didn't want to have too much concentration in emerging markets. Moving on, you've selected onto four funds. I've added all the four Mundi funds in my portfolio with an overall top-down allocation of 60% to equities, 40% to fixed income. Within equities, I've chosen to take a US bias. So 40% of this allocation is to Amundi Prime USA Fund, 10% into the Amundi Index MSCI World Fund, and 10% into the Amundi Index MSCI Emerging Markets Equities. We ensure that the sum total adds up to 100%. So again, 60% into equities via three Amundi Index Funds, and then one via the Fixed Income Fund. So what you'll see here is we've provided a high level summary of historical returns of this portfolio going back through 2006, the average annual return. So again, the range of returns for this portfolio, the 60, 40 portfolio is down 25% to up 28% on an annual calendar year. The average annual return is 6.7%. And obviously we have the lowest cost. So the total annual fee, including the Endowis access fee is 0.7%. What I'll see on the next slide is here is the goal projection mapping for our clients in the portfolio selected. The chart on the left tracks the median outcome of this 60% equity, 40% fixed income portfolio. It comfortably exceeds the basic deposit or even a 2.5% rate over the longer term. The figure is net of fees. Again, there are no upfront sales charges. You access the cheaper share class. This is much lower than the industry average. To some investors, they want to look at the underlying holdings, such as the top 10 holdings, the markets, the geographic allocation, or the sector exposures. We provide those as well. So here we have the tracking of the portfolio performance over time. So you can see here for this portfolio that's constructed, I have the historical returns of this constructed portfolio. And over there, you can see them by different calendar years and over rolling different periods as well. Okay, and I'll turn it back to Sam. Hey, Sam, you're muted. Great, thank you, Sean. One of the most important things about the Endowed's platform um, is the flexibility that it offers, uh, because we know that each individual investor has different personal needs, different investment goals, and different investment horizons. And so it's really important for you to curate uh, the solutions that is most suitable for you and for your goals. Um, and each goal may be very different. Um, so for, uh, and also the level of uh, comfort, uh, the level of risk that you're willing to take is also very, very different. And so we have uh, built out a, 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 a slate of solutions uh, that allows you to really pick and choose what is the most appropriate for you. So it starts with our core satellite concept of having a core uh, portfolio, which is globally diversified, is low cost, is managed professionally by the Endowers Investment Office, and is the lowest cost possible, which is, achieves the best outcomes. And within that core, we have flagship, which is the best of all worlds. We have passive equities, we have factor-based dimensional equities, we have active fixed income from PIMCO and um, uh, sorry, factor-based 
fixed income from dimensional. So it gives you the best of passive, active, and systematic quant uh, factors, the proven factors of returns. But some clients have told us that, hey, I want this factor separately. And others have actually come to us and said, hey, I, I want a pure passive portfolio. And so this Amundi launch is going to give us the opportunity for all of our investors to have what is effectively a purely passive indexed uh, portfolio, um, exposing yourself to the markets uh, and the indexes that you are most um, that you want, basically. Uh, and these four are the ones that are most required, requested uh, by our investment base. And then within core, there is one other option, which is ESG. So in order to provide a sustainable long-term you know, portfolio um, and values-driven investment, uh, we launched the first retail-ready ESG uh, solution that is institutional grade. And so within that core product, if you don't know what I'm talking about, everything this has gone over your head, then just go with the flagship because that is the first portfolio of choice. It's the most uh, diversified, optimized, even among the factors, it has gives you just enough exposure. And that flagship return, um, which I think we're just publishing a new uh, article that shows an updated return uh, number, but that flagship has uh, not only beaten all of our competitors or other robos and digital platforms, uh, but it's actually beaten the global index as well slightly. Uh, but then we also provide you with other options like satellite portfolios, income portfolios to generate passive income, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But today, because of the Amundi launch and the Amundi portfolios are going to be available on the FundSmart platform first. And the FundSmart platform is an open-ended uh, fund distribution platform. Um, the difference being that um, on the next page, um, we can go into a little bit more detail. Uh, the FundSmart DIY kind of offering is, first of all, it's curated and it's screened. And Sean will go into a lot more detail on how we do this. This is one of the biggest value adds of Indawas. Indawas Investment Office is a 10 person team uh, that has a significant industry experience. Um, there's professional companies like Mercer and Cambridge and Morningstar and, and Towers Willis Watson, uh, which are called investment consultant firms that you know, basically uh, provide consultant services for sovereign wealth funds, institutional investors, pension funds, uh, and insurance companies and they provide this professional service and say okay i'm going to look at the universe of funds out there and i'm going to screen it and curate it so that you get to choose the best ones now that is something that is very costly and only available to really big institutions but the endowers investment office is making that available to every single retail investor individual investor here in singapore this kind of institutional service is amazing and so the Endowments Investment Office, I think, is providing tremendous value by giving you not just 2,000 funds to choose from on Fund Supermarket or Dollar Dex or Poems uh, or the brokers or other banks. We're actually choosing the best in class funds for each category and working with every single partner that's out there who, who can actually provide the products. And some of them weren't available here in Singapore. And we had to work with them to bring into Singapore like we are doing with Amundi. And previously, we did with the Vanguard funds. Um, and the FundSmart is a DIY platform allows you to customize, as Sean just told, showed you, uh, with the Amundi funds. But later on, we'll provide more uh, um, examples of how you can effectively use that. And obviously, it's across all of your source of funds, cash, CPF, and SRS. And I think some, there was a question in the Q&A uh, in Slido asking about the total cost of investing in these funds. Um, for single fund purchases on the FundSmart platform, there is a platform charge of 0.3%. It's the lowest uh, in the industry. Um, uh, the platform fee that um, it, it's, it's, it's similar uh, to what FundSmart charges, uh, FundSupermart charges, the IFAS FundSupermart charges. And other platforms will tell you, hey, we don't charge you any platform fees, no sales charges. But the way all of those guys make money is shown here. <laughs> they make money from the trailer fees. So the trailer fees are going to give you significantly more returns uh, for poems, you know, FSM and dollar decks than the fee, the transparent flat fee that we're charging at Indawas. So I'll give you two examples. The first one is access to an institutional fund. So PIMCO Income Fund, which is a very popular fund, uh, suffering from performance issues recently, but a fantastic fund long-term with long-term track record. 
uh, and it will come back. Um, so if you look at this PINCO income fund, there are two share classes. There's a retail share class, which costs 1.49%, right? Uh, sorry, 1.45% here. Um, but for in for Indawas, PIMCO has launched a Singapore dollar hedged institutional fund that is accumulating, not distributing. Uh, but we also have the distributing share class you can choose at a fund level fee of 0.55%. So it's the exact same fund, but on Indawas, you pay 0.55. On every other platform, they say 1.45%. And then they tell you, Oh, we don't charge you sales charge. Oh, we don't have trade, you know, we don't have any other hidden fees. We have no platform fees or access fees. And so they say that this is, you know, going to be cheaper. But in effect, if you look at it on the endowed platform fee uh, of 30 basis points, 0.3%, even if you add that back on to an institutional fund, you get to a total cost of 0.85%. On poems and dollar decks, it's 1.45%. FSM, Fund Supermart, has the goal to charge not only the take the trailer fee, but they also charge you an additional access platform fee. So that platform fee is because this is fixed income is 0.2. For equity funds, it's actually 0.3, exactly the same as in Dawas. But again, we take give you access to the institutional fund, which is a fraction of the cost versus all these other platforms which charge you an arm and a leg and they pretend to give you savings, but in effect, in, in effect, they're charging you significantly more than in Dallas's, even with our fees. Now, if you look at a retail, common retail share class, every single retail share class has trailer fees embedded into it. So it's not transparent, it's not shared. Uh, most distributors don't even tell you what the trailer fee is, um, and there's no regulatory requirement for them to do so. They take it out of the NAV. So it comes out of your returns. So um, the Allianz Fund Income and Growth Fund, which is another very popular income um, equity and um, uh, fixed income balance portfolio uh, fund, this actually is the retail fund is 1.55%. On the Endows platform, all the other platforms, exactly the same price of 1.55. But what's different with Endows is there is that trailer fee embedded of 0.625%. And we give that all back to the client. So we don't keep a single cent that's paid by the fund manager to the distributor. And we give that all back 100%. So as you know, we announced you know, several months back that we've returned more than $2 million of cash back. So this is effectively a cash back system that we have where we return what's rightfully yours, whereas every other platform keeps that money. And therefore, um, the access fee of 0.3% is intentionally priced um, at a price that will always be lower, including these trailer fees combined than every other platform. So on this 1.55% uh, fee re uh, retail share class for Allianz Income and Growth, even if you add back the endowers fee of 0.3%, the total all-in cost is still only 1.225 versus the 1.55 that Poems and Dollar Dex charges. And again, I told you the equities fund or multi-asset funds on FSM, uh, sorry, is actually 35 basis points. 0.35 is actually higher than I thought. 0.35%, uh, which is at, at every level higher than the endowments platform fee. And therefore the total cost of using FSM is 1.9%. So for goodness sake, please don't use FSM. Use, you know, if you have to use dollar decks and poems, it's cheaper than FSM. I'm not saying that because I'm targeting FSM. I'm just saying for the exact same fund, why pay more? But on the endowers platform, every single fund is going to be uh, cheaper or 95% or of the funds uh, and increasingly get, getting to 98% of the funds will be cheaper on the endowers platform. Or because we access the institutional share class, it will not be available on any other platform. So this Amundi index fund is not available on the other three platforms. It's not available at DBS. It's not available on any other distributor. It's exclusively available, available only on Indawas. And we, we are talking and we are discussing taking it into CPF. Um, so we'll update everybody when the time comes. Um, you know, we talked about the mention of going to CPF forever. It still hasn't happened. So we don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. So please look out for it. Uh, we are trying. Um, and it will come, but hopefully it will be sooner rather than later. And we'll let you know as soon as that's available. But today, the Amundi index funds are available on cash 
funds and also SRS. So please use it for your SRS as well. And if you haven't uh, saved money on your SRS, please do so before the end of the year so that you can receive tax breaks. Amazing system that allows you to compound over the long term by saving on taxes and using low cost index funds like Mundi now. Back to you, John. Thank you, Sam. So we wanted to take a step back here and talk about what it takes for a fund to make it onto the Endowless platform. We always talk about best in class or top performing managers, but what exactly does this mean? I'll try to explain this weeks or months long process in two minutes. So we start with the universe of all available funds across all asset classes and regions. This is a universe of several thousand funds covering broad investable asset classes out in the market. And Dallas has a relationship with close to 70 of top tier fund manager companies. We act in our client's best interests. We scour the universe to find the best fund, regardless of fund manager. The Endowless Investment Office has created a, a proprietary scorecard that balances a fund's risk and return. Higher returns for lower risk screen higher. This gives us a short list of funds, and we start the deep dive work, which is the rigorous due diligence process. We vet a fund across multiple metrics, looking at fund manager's experience, investment philosophy and process, how their risk fra management framework looks like, how the performance track record looks like, to name a few. We obviously look at fees uh, as well, and this is an important driver of kind of the total returns over the long term. For some perspective, we conduct about 100 to 200 due diligence calls on an annual basis. On the back of these calls, we fill up a detailed questionnaire, justifying why it makes sense to onboard a certain fund. We discuss this extensively, and we finally decide whether or not we would like to onboard the fund. So what happens, the end result here is the Endowless FundSmart platform, which is a close to 200 unique fund platform where clients looking to make directed investments can come to to buy their selected funds. So we wanted to run through an example of how this looks like. So if I start within FundSmart, this is the FundSmart landing page. As an investor, you can choose between filters on the left. For example, I can choose between equity funds or fixed income funds or search for a particular fund house or fund to narrow this filters down. In this case, I've selected tech and mega trends. This filters the FundSmart list into available funds that fit into the technology sector or part of the global secular trend, such as healthcare, cybersecurity, or 5G. So the next result is I have a short list, and I can select any fund that falls within this tech and megatrends list. In this case, we selected the Black Rockwell Technology Fund. So let's find out more about this fund. On the individual fund landing page here, you can see at the top, the Black Rockwell Technology Fund. We can read about what the fund does. In this case, the Black Rockwell Tech Fund invests into leading technology companies globally. It takes a combination of core and opportunistic names. The fund has a bias towards larger companies, i.e. the market incumbents. Conducts, they very, conduct very strong university screening analysis. They have a diversified portfolio of about 70 names. So again, a lot of investors hold the, the popular FANG names, but 70 names is highly diversified. So investors do appreciate this diversity. The teams are running the strategy for over 20 years. Essentially, what I've done here is I've summarized the key highlights. So this is what we've done through that months long diligence process, right? We've identified that the Black Rockwell Technology Fund within global equities with sector focus on technology, this is one of the top performing funds that we're very convicted in. So we summarize our comments over here. So if I choose this fund, what we'll see over here is I can go down and I can see the investment performance of the fund across different time periods through the most recent date. So obviously you'll see that technology has seen a sharper drawdown year to date over here on the right, on the back of more significant multiple compression, as Sam talked about kind of the macro markets putting a lot of pressure, particularly on a lot of growth stocks and technology falls square in this category as well. So if I go down and look at more details about the fund, I'll see that the asset class exposure, it's 100% equities. I can see the geographical breakdown as well, the sector breakdown, or even the holdings breakdown. So one of the powerful features of FundSmart is the ability to compare different funds. So I can compare up to four funds. So in this case, I wanted to create a portfolio, as we talked about earlier, the Amundi Passive Index Funds and the Black Rockwell Technology Fund. So I'm thinking about complementing my broad passive developed market exposure via the Amundi index fund with the Black Rockwell Technology Fund to take a bit more of a tilt towards technology. So that's exactly what we've done here. 
I select the World Technology Fund at the top, and I select the Amundi Index MSCI World Fund. So these are the two funds that I've selected for my portfolio. So in this slide, I can compare the performance, the performance of the two funds. So what I'll see is obviously the performance of the BlackRock World Technology Fund in the blue line. And with the green line, I look at the performance of the Amundi Index MSCI World Fund. So it's no surprise that the World Technology Fund has outperformed over the last two years, in fact, and then recently has seen a sharper drawdown as well. So I'm comfortable with these two funds. Let's proceed. So other comparisons we can take a look at are the sector concentrations of the two. I can also look at what kind of fees are charged for the portfolios. So you can see here, obviously, we are the lowest cost and we are completely transparent in the fees that we charge. So once I've done this analysis, I can go in and purchase these funds in my preferred allocation. So here are the two funds. I can select the allocation that I want to have these two funds in, and I can go ahead and purchase them. Okay, and with that, I'll turn it back to Sam. Great, thank you. Um, so um, if you have any questions as a follow-up, uh, I'm gonna deal with a lot of great questions on the Slido poll, but before I do, quick shout out to these wonderful people, these pictures that you see here. This is our client advisory team. Um, of course, we have more people, but we've uh, taken a mix of uh, the brightest and the best, I think. Uh, and we mix these pictures around. So different webinar, different pictures. Uh, but basically our, our team of licensed advisors, MAS licensed advisors, great industry experience from Morgan Stanley, UBS, Credit Suisse, you know, Saxo, everywhere. Um, and uh, really, really uh, here to help you um, to, you know, help you maybe on board uh, with the Endowers platform, maybe, you know, talk to you about, you know, which portfolios uh, and which funds are suitable for you. Uh, whatever you want to actually talk about, you can walk through the platform, uh, go through that fun smart experience that uh, Sean did. Uh, you can actually just uh, scan the QR code um, or visit um, the Indowers.com Financial Advisor Singapore website. You can actually book a 15 minute consultation, like just over the phone uh, or a Zoom. Uh, you can do WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, you know, email, phone, whatever you want. Um, and then this experience in Dawas is every Friday at 12 p.m. You can log on, uh, you can book it, and just during your lunch, really uh, in experience in Dawas in a closer way. So please reach out to uh, the client advisor team. Uh, we'd be happy to assist you in the onboarding or investment processes or if you need to consult anybody. Now, um, on the slider questions, if, if I summarize all of the slider questions, there's a lot of similar questions. Um, so I'm going to address the first one, which is, you know, a lot of questions related to how is this different from Vanguard? Um, so uh, among the passive index fund universe, the biggest players obviously is Vanguard in the US. Uh, globally, it's BlackRock. In Europe, it's Amundi. In Asia, I think, you know, Vanguard has already pulled out. So BlackRock, Amundi, you know, uh, Deutsche and Invesco and other players are in the space. Uh, but really, effectively, I think, um, you know, Mundi's new launch uh, solution uh, on the Endows platform, these passive index funds are the lowest cost. It's the most efficient uh, and it's the best uh, solutions for each of those sectors. So I think specifically somebody, um, you know, asked me about the Vanguard VWRA, um, uh, I think uh, is the global global FTSE. Um, actually, it's a slightly different index from the MSCI Acquis, it's a FTSE index. Uh, now, there is a difference between the FTSE all country and all world index and the MSCI all country world index. Um, the marginal differences in geographies, the slight difference in sectors, for example, the FTSE is higher in technology, the MSCI is lower in tech. Uh, the second largest is consumer discretionary versus, you know, something else in ACQUI. So there's slight differences in sector, but effectively it's the same. Now, the Vanguard FTSE all world country uses ETF is a very popular uh, uh, ETF that people use. The cost of that is 0.22%. If you combine, uh, and Sean, maybe we can go back to the total, the, the four Amundi funds that we have um, launched and look at the fees there, um, the uh, page 12, I think, yeah, this one. Um, you can see that the MSCI world, the developed market index is 0.18. The MSCI emerging market index is 0.2%. 
the emerging market weight in the global index is anything between like 12 to 15 percent uh depends on the cycle depends on the index you use so if you allocate less than 20 percent effectively the cost of this combined exposure if you create that all world country uh, msci replication by adding world and a 12 15 percent allocation to emerging market or if you believe in emerging markets maybe you can do 20 percent the total combined cost is going to be just barely above 18 basis points versus VWRA of 22 basis points. So Amundi is actually cheaper. But on top of that, VWRA is actually not only more expensive, it's actually in US dollars. So there's a cost of you as a Singapore dollar, uh, dollar investor of converting that into a foreign currency. Now, if you believe US dollar strengthening, then that's great. But if you're investing now and you look through the cycle and you invest long term, Sing dollar has actually outperformed the US dollar over the really long term. So there is a currency risk embedded on top of that. Now, there's an additional point here. ETF versus index funds. ETFs are listed. Index funds are unlisted. They're exactly the same open-ended mutual fund, right? We, we ascertain that the unit trust structure and the ETF structure is exactly the same. It's an open-ended mutual fund. The only difference being unit trusts are unlisted and trades once a day and ETFs trades throughout the day based on a bizarre spread on a stock exchange. And so it has more liquidity is the positive, but the negative is that the price that people are willing to pay to buy and sell it is actually different from the underlying portfolio's value, which is the NAV. So in a down market, like we're experiencing now, a lot of people are selling the VWRA and when there's less liquidity, these ETFs trade at a discount, up to 10% discount to the true value of the portfolio. Whereas the unit trust index fund is always going to be trading at the NAV, the true value of the portfolio. So not only are you removing FX uh, risk by actively engaging in a large fund manager that can hedge and denominate in sing dollars very at extremely low cost, virtually no cost to investors, but also the discount factor and the bid ask spread when there's less liquidity. I mean, VWR is very liquid, so there's no bid ask spread really. There's very minimal. So it's not going to be any different from that perspective. But when markets are down, it trades at a discount, which is a risk. So multiple factors, which, you know, and especially if you're in Singapore, you're not actively trading ETFs intraday, in and out every day. You don't really, you only need once a day pricing, really. So the unit trust index option, fund option, we believe, is a much more efficient. Uh, way uh, to gain exposure and a lower cost way and a more efficient way uh, removing some of the risks, including the uh, FX risk uh, that is embedded into these ETFs. So I wanted to highlight that. The other thing was uh, this question about Infinity versus Amundi, which I've already explained. Amundi is cheaper, exactly the same fund. And, th and to that point, I think it doesn't matter whether it's a Vanguard fund or a BlackRock fund or an Amundi fund or a Deutsche fund. If you are looking at it, it, what's important is what index are, is this passive index fund using? Is it US S&P 500 or US Prime? Is it MSCI World? If it's the exact same index and effectively you're getting 99% replication or 97% replication of the, the market that you want exposure to, it doesn't matter which fund manager because you're getting the exact same exposure. So what's important then is all about cost. If you can just find the lowest cost way then that's the one you go with. Whether it's BlackRock, Vanguard, doesn't matter. But then if you, there is a difference between unit trust and ETF. So that's the other piece. Uh, full transparency, there is a withholding tax benefit for usage-based ETFs. US ETFs are the worst. Usage ETFs are the most efficient. Passive index funds in unit trust is, um, can be best of both worlds, um, but it's uh, slightly more costly from withholding tax, but it's marginal. And also, if you actually replicate and not have direct physical uh, exposure, some passive index funds use futures, then you actually have zero withholding tax. So it's actually even more effective. So you have to look at the structure of the fund. Uh, so going back to that question about dimensional, yes, it is a purely factor-based investment. It is low cost for what it does. But Amundi, once again, as a pure passive exposure, tracking the index is always going to be cheaper because DFA uh, dimensional has this factor-driven investment. But factor-driven investor investment model, the dimensional is the cheapest out there. 
Now, one final question point that keeps coming up is money out. You know, how do they compare versus our funds? Um, I, I think they, especially the CPF portfolio that was launched, uh, kudos for them to, uh, to bring that into CPF. But unfortunately, their portfolio is actually very, very um, mixed because uh, very, very shallow because effectively you're getting um, on the equity side one fund, which is the MSCI World Index. So it's purely a developed market index as opposed to a gl truly globally diversified uh, ACQUI or FTSE all country index. So I think that's that's going to be uh, the key difference. And it's only two funds. I think they, they have some trouble because they use IFAST. Uh, there is some limitations to that. Uh, and therefore, it's a two fund portfolio, which we believe is a little bit inefficient. It's not truly diversified. Uh, and the cost is, is, is you know, um, is, is, uh, is the same, right? Um, and the thing is that on the endows platform, because we're a flexible, agnostic, open platform, you can actually recreate the exact same portfolio um, in the FundSmart portfolio and um, will always be cheaper uh, than any other platform. But with the Amundi launch and uh, on the FundSmart platform, this is the cheapest way to gain exposure to passive index funds. So I'll stop there. <laughs> any other questions that um, people are asking that we should answer? Sean, do you see any that you? Um, yeah, Sam, there's one There's one question on the currency. Maybe I'll start and you can chime in as well. The mm -hmm. question is, how big is the currency impact given that these are sing dollar denominated Amundi funds as well? So I think the short answer here is that for the equity funds, the sing dollar is unhedged. So when you, when you buy into this fund, you're exposed to the currency fluctuations between sing dollar and the underlying constituents, which are typically in US dollar on a daily basis. So the point that we're making is that on the Forex conversion, if you were to buy a comparable fund denominated in US dollar, you face the FX conversion at your own risk or at the time in which you convert, and then you buy into the fund, and then you're holding a US dollar denominated fund until the time in which you redeem it, and then you'll face the Forex conversion on the back end when you do redeem the fund. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's two layers of FX cost. One is the transaction cost, right? So you're a sing dollar investor. You have, I don't know, $50,000 that you want to invest in a US dollar denominated uses fund. Then you have to convert it. And if you do it not efficiently, then obviously the bank charges, the broker charges. If you use a robo platform, then they charge an additional FX uh, fee. And therefore, it's actually quite a big uh, spread that they're eating. Um, more than all of these kind of, you know, Amundi fund total cost, annual cost. Um, so uh, FX cost from a transaction perspective, and remember you have to buy it and then later on sell it and convert it back to sing dollars with another FX cost, transaction cost layer. So that's the first layer. The second layer is what Sean just explained. But on that, I think, you know, fixed income, being able to hedge in sing dollars is huge. That's a, that's a big impact where it completely removes uh, the risk of FX conversion or FX volatility. And so I think that's that's a true benefit. But regardless of FX cost, I just want to highlight again that even the VWRA, you know, Vanguard or any other platform fee, uh, any other uses based ETFs, uh, these Amundi index funds are actually cheaper. So just just it's just cheap um, without additional cost of FX or anything else, uh, brokerage fees or bid our spread or you know discount to NAV, uh, all these other factors. You take that out. Um, even if it's the same, it's still cheaper. So I want to highlight that, especially the Prime USA, but even the MSCI World and the MSCI Emerging Market, we showed in the slides cheaper than SGX listed ETFs and cheaper than most uses based ETFs. Although there are cheaper ones and US is cheaper. So uh, admittedly, that is true. But um, if you look at the total cost here in Singapore, it is actually the most cheapest. Oh, sorry, there's, there's a lot of questions about whether uh, these Amundi funds will go into the core portfolios or the advice portfolios, uh, flagship portfolios. Um, the basic simple answer is yes, we will. Um, obviously, there is a process for us to do so. Always, we will launch new funds on the FundSmart platform. It has to be on the FundSmart platform for us to be able to build it into the platform. All the advice portfolios will receive a, a recommended portfolio change. Uh, we hope to be able to execute on that very soon. Uh, and then the next step after that, um, basically, we'll be recommending a switch out of certain higher cost index funds into lower cost of Mundi index funds. So that's natural. It's, it's what it, Endowas does. 
Um, it's what's in, in the best interest of our clients. And therefore, and the reason why we brought it in was so that we can change it for our portfolios as well. So for those of you, uh, if you can just hold tight, it's almost there. Uh, we'll be able to announce it hopefully soon. Um, so there are some technical difficulties in uh, achieving this, but we will get there. So please have patience with us and we'll announce that very soon. The next steps are when it happens, CPF, when it happens, we'll do you know additional index funds. So we hope to have a range of index funds from maybe even other portfolio managers, fund managers, uh, which are equally or even lower cost. So in Dallas's beauty is that we will continue to search the, the world over to find a better solution, lower cost solution, a more efficient solution. When we find that, we'll put that on the FundSmart platform first, and then we'll exchange uh, the existing uh, funds on the advice portfolio so that uh, the clients um, who are in the advice portfolios, core portfolios can benefit from that. Okay, great. I think we are on time. Uh, just crossed it. Is there any other questions that you see that maybe we should? Um, some of these, uh, sorry, there are, there are some questions about passive active perform better for emerging markets. Uh, I think that uh, it really does depend on the time horizon. Um, um, and, you know, at different periods of time, passive and active do, um, you know, pa active does sometimes better, sometimes does uh, the worst. On average, active fund managers more than half underperform, even in emerging markets, and sometimes 90% plus underperform, depending on what period. So it's difficult to find consistent performance in emerging markets um, among active investors. It's normally, okay, this year, Morgan Stanley outperformed, this year, you know, Schroeder's outperformed, but then over the long term, Schroeder's is underperformed or, you know, more Stanley's underperformed. So it, it really is um, about consistency of returns. For passive index funds, there's no guessing in it. You're just going to get the index market return. So um, as long as it's low cost, that's exactly what it's going to do. So one way to do it is to build a mix. If you want to have an active portfolio uh, a fund and then a passive fund and then a dimensional factor-based fund and mix up a emerging market portfolio, then you can do that too. But I think you know for that, you can just you know invest in a flagship uh, portfolio from Endowers. Um, but I mean, the flexibility is there for, for you to do what you need to do. Um, and I think that, you know, regardless of whether it's emerging markets or developed markets or U.S. or fixed income, uh, passive investment is, um, you know, is always going to be a low cost, um, you know, uh, best uh, investment option for you. Sean, shall we wrap up or do you see any other questions? I think that's it, Sam. Okay. Well, with that, thank you so much for staying on with us for over the hour again. Uh, I hope that was super helpful. Once again, if we can go to the advisor uh, slide, please scan the QR code um, and uh, join us on our Friday sessions where we educate and experience, um, you know, in Dawas from our MAS licensed um, advisors. And with that, um, you can replay this on YouTube. Uh, so some some people, maybe they, they joined late and the questions are on the um, slide over. We actually answered that in an earlier part of uh, the session. So please scroll through. You don't have to watch the whole thing. Uh, you can just pick and choose where you want to. Uh, and with that, I want to thank Sean, uh, our head of investment. Um, I forgot to introduce, but we worked together at Morgan Stanley. Sean was an amazing uh, partner in the private wealth uh, business at Morgan Stanley, a senior a person who did a, a lot of this uh, product due diligence and, you know, portfolio uh, uh, construction and advising, um, you know, large, very large in investors and high net worth clients uh, at Morgan Stanley. So really excited to have him uh, join us. It's been a while, but um, this is his first official Endowers webinar debut. So, so excited. And you'll see a lot more of Sean going forward. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Sean. Thanks, Sam. And thanks, everyone. Have a good day.